Welcome back to another episode of Pod Shots, where we kick off Season 2, Episode 1. To kick off Season 2, we have a special guest, Jonas Van Balen. Jonas was born and raised in Belgium, studied finance, and then started playing poker online in 2008. Became professional in 2010, mostly playing online, but also playing at tournaments such as WSOP in Las Vegas. Jonas currently resides in the Philippines where he is a digital nomad. He is involved in the esports industry and he started an e-commerce business on Amazon, which he sold in 2020 this year. He is an awesome and diverse individual and we had a fantastic conversation that I think you guys will really enjoy. Oh, and our liquor of choice this week, Johnny Walker Black Label. It's a beautiful blended scotch whiskey, very smooth and one of the best whiskeys we've had so far. So with that said, sit back, relax, grab yourself a drink, and welcome to episode one, season two of Pot Shots. Uh, I'm kind of in Medellin right now. So I am. Oh, okay, cool. So How's it going on? Uh, you met him there before, uh, last time you went there, or you already knew uh, from before that? Uh, so I've been a couple times in the last couple years. Uh, but, and then I came back down in February, got stuck because of Corona and decided to just stay. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, love it. It's an amazing city. Amazing people. Uh, amazing city that you don't see that much right now. And Clement, you've been here. So you know how awesome it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, uh, funnily enough, um, I think you used to live there, didn't you, uh, Jonas? Uh, no, I used to live in Ecuador, in Quito for a while, but I've actually never been to Colombia. So, uh, ah, but yeah, I, uh, I heard some good stories about it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think it's cause we, we, we've both been, we've all been to places we haven't been. So I haven't been to Ecuador, but I would like to go. Apparently it's very earthly there. Like the air is really clean and there's beautiful views and things, but, uh, yeah, yeah. For sure. And also, I mean, like, uh, the city of Quito, you know, I'm not sure like how, how high up a Medellin is, but, uh, I, th- I think Quito is about like 3000 meters. So it's actually like really, really high up there. And, uh, the temperature is always like, yeah, pretty nice. Like year round, you know, it's just not too hot, not too cold. Uh, so yeah. Nice. That's an interesting thing about Medellin too. It's like the, the temperature changes, right? I mean, towards the end of the day, it starts to get a lot cooler. And so even if it was really hot during the day, you know, you're always going to get that break towards the end, which I really yeah. like. Well, it's always like the same temperature here. So you get like 75, 80 degree weather during the day, year round. And then the evening, it's like 60 or so. It's nice yeah. and cool. Um, yeah, it's quite nice. Yeah, can't complain. <clears throat> Not like the Philippines. Yeah, the Philippines, Philippines is a little too, too warm, especially now. Um, I'm not sure how much it is in Fahrenheit, but I think about 90 or something. So, uh, it's, uh, yeah. It's and, and if it says it's 20, if it says it's 25, it feels like it's 30 because of the humidity. Mm-hmm. So you, you know, like it's always misleading because it's so, so feels so hot there compared to, I don't know, a drier place. That's where you are right now though. Right. Manila. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm Manila right now. Mm-hmm. What's it, what's it like there during the whole quarantine? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm mostly inside, um, but, uh, it's, I mean, like people are pretty strict in following the rules. Like for example, if you go outside, everyone's wearing a mask and, and all that, like, it's very different in, in where I'm from. Like for example, in Belgium, people don't really wear any masks uh, right now. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty okay. Um, like we actually, I think we've had like the longest lockdown of like all countries in the world uh, here. So it's just uh, recently got like changed to like a general community lockdown or something. So we can go out now more, but it, it's still, it's still a lockdown. So uh, Isn't, don't you find that? Movement? Sorry, what was that Brandon? Did they like it restrict your movement at all? Like were you allowed to go outside like often or? Um, there's a cure, like a, a curfew. So you can't go out anymore after 5 PM. Um, but even you actually weren't allowed to do anything except for like essential things like going to the groceries or, 
uh, even I think like for a few weeks, like walking your dog was not allowed outside. Like you had to do it within the perimeters of your house or whatever. So for, which for people who have their pets in their apartments, that's pretty difficult to do. Yeah. Although like, for example, I, I live in like a big condominium building. So there is like a small, you know, like smoking area that we could have used, you know, down for your dog or something. Okay, yeah. yeah. It's makes it, it easier. pretty restricting. Yeah. Than having like just piles of shit in your, uh, in your living room. <laughs> hey buddy, let's go walk to the kitchen today. We're gonna walk. <laughs> oh man. It's so, it's so tough for some people. I'm so lucky to be out of that situation, but what yeah, really yeah. kind of, kind of confuses me about the mask situation. And I know we're not talking about coronavirus, but I think it's worth, worth mentioning. Like it's shocking to me how early on Asians, and I think this might be because they're just used to having face masks, I don't know, pollution, mm -hmm. mares, yeah. SARS, whatever. So, but it's shocking to me how the, and, and, and maybe you know better science about this than I do, but it, it just seems to me so obvious that wearing a face mask would have a positive impact, like net overall, as opposed to not. And so it, I, I just, I was standing in a, in a queue yesterday to go into the supermarket and the guy in front of me was smoking a vape and I saw the smoke drift away. And I was like, hang on a second. There's no reason why our breath isn't doing that. So what's this two meter rule? Cause it's just flying all over the place. Yeah. And I was, I was, I was just thinking to myself, wow. <clears throat> I, I, I've been debating that a lot in the U S like if you were to cough and someone was six feet away and they're using the six foot rule, like, would it actually be effective? I mean, yeah, wearing a mask helps a lot, but mm -hmm. it can travel in the air quite a ways. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it feels kind of dumb. It does feel a bit dumb, doesn't it? And then all the, so all the Asians are wearing the masks and we're not. And I, and I just don't, I don't get it. I don't get why it hasn't become a thing yet, but maybe there's some political reason for it. I don't know. Um, I think people just don't think it looks cool. That's why. I don't <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I've seen some really stylish things though. Yeah, uh, I think it's as simple as that. People just think they look silly and they don't do it. So, yeah, it's possible because no one else is doing it. So, uh, uh, I'm sure if more people start doing it, then more people will join because it becomes less of, a, of an, an issue, really. But, yeah, uh, well, no, nah, it sucks anyway. But enough about COVID, I suppose. Uh, we're here to talk yeah. about you. Uh, namely your uh, history with gambling. <laughs> that sounds so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Problem. <laughs> yeah, but like, I'm really, I, I don't think I've ever spoken to you about this. I, I think we've touched on it a couple of times because, you know, we've known each other for years now, but I don't think I've ever really sat down and had a proper proper talk with you about it. And it, and it is really interesting yeah. to me because a lot of, a lot of people, I don't think they realize how much, how much money you can actually make doing online gambling. You know, it's just a <laughs> thing for them. But, yeah. um, but like how much money did you, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> how, how did you, how did you even get involved in online gambling to begin with? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good question. But, but need, like, like I first would like to say something like, uh, indeed, like a lot of people, they don't know that it's possible to, to make money with gambling. Um, I mean, over the long term, that is, but, um, it's also true. It really depends on, on your game. Of course, like there are very few gambling games where you can actually make money long term. Like for example, poker is one of them just because of how the game works. But for example, it's really hard or I think almost impossible. Um, for example, to win at games like roulette or, or something. Um, so, um, you always got to make that distinction. And because a lot of people still need, like they think about gambling as it's impossible to make money with long term because it's, you know, it's gambling. It's always the, like the odds uh, against you. Uh, but there are a few games where, you know, it's possible uh, to actually, if you understand the game, if you understand the theory behind it to, to make money, um, like the two that come on the top of my head are poker and sports betting. Um, like right. these two, you can make money at them if you are really good, but a lot of people still, of course, lose money at, uh, because of, you know, the whole, like, like, um, of course uh, the house always takes a portion of, of, of the action. So, mm. um, it's more than like 50, 50 people that win or lose because with the house, they take away some match. So it's more like, you know, 80 lose 20 win, something like that. 
Okay. Uh, so it's more like a statistical kind of battle over time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, to, to get back at your, at your question now. So I basically started like, um, I think like most other players, like um, basically uh, my friends, they invited me for a home game. I think this was in like 2008 uh, or something. And we started playing some poker. I've never had played the game before. I've heard about it. So like I knew about things like a flush in the full house, but I had no idea like what the rankings were or anything like that. Uh, so then they explained the game, we started playing, and I, I, I just like really, really liked the game. But I've always kind of like like liked uh, card games. For example, like when I was younger, like me and my dad would play, you know, like this, these you know innocent uh, games, and no money involved, but still, you know, it's just uh, fun to play the card games. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I just had a fun night, and, I, and after that night, I remember I just went online and I was looking for like poker strategy. Uh, just because I wanted to get to know the game better. And also, of course, I wanted to, you know, become better in the next home game, you know, like beat my friends. And, uh, and then I, I also kind of like found out that there are like certain poker strategy sites online as well, where you can um, basically, yeah, uh, learn strategy. And um, there was this one particular site called pokerstrategy.com. And they... Um, so they had a big database of like coaches, you know, trying to teach other people how to play the game. And um, they had this promotion that if you um, do a particular quiz and you pass for the quiz, they would give you $50 that you can play on a, on a poker site. And so the way they make money is... Um, basically they are the affiliate. So if you sign up to a poker site, um, the poker site gives some money that it takes from the games, uh, which we call rake and gives it to the affiliate. Uh, mm. So if you play a lot of games and you actually are a good player and you don't lose money, so you keep playing the games and then you also keep paying the rake, uh, the poker site, you know, keeps distributing them like a portion of their break that they get from you to the affiliate. So that's how they make money. Um, and so that's why they are very incentivized to make their players better so that they can, you know, continue playing in the games and they don't, you know, lose their bankroll. Um, and if people keep playing in these games, you know, they start making more and more money. Uh, like for example, they gave me $50, but I mean, I think I gave them probably about six figures or something in rig <laughs> to them personally. Oh, so. <laughs> Uh, how did you feel? Like, how did you feel when you first, like, when you first made money from gambling? Was there Sorry, ever a, my my doorbell rings? Yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. Actually, you know what? This is a good opportunity to like introduce the drink of the day. What do you think, Brandon? Wait, you can still hear? I can still hear you. Okay. Yeah, I was kind of flapping with the microphone. We have got. Yeah, sorry about that. No, this is a good opportunity actually to break into it because we we didn't early on, and I think that this was like this was almost like uh, heaven sent. So we we yeah. decided today to to drink Black Label. I'm not sure if you were able to get some, but yeah, it, it's, I actually it's did get the some. Original one. Uh, I went to the store, but they didn't have it. But then uh, I went to my friend, and uh, she still uh, had a bottle. It's a uh, it's. Half empty, but uh, I can join in on the fun. Half empty or half full? Depends how you look at it, bro. <laughs> Mine's yeah. about half full too, so right there with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm going to pour a shot now. And uh, it's 6 a.m., remember, here. We're all in three separate time zones. Yeah, I'm also uh, just been awake for uh, about one hour or something, one and a half hour. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. But this one's pretty. This one's a pretty good whiskey. Like to, I think, take shots of compared to maybe Jameson. I'm not sure. Not that I'm putting Jameson down. It's just. Yeah. This is bottled in Scotland, so I guess it technically is. What What really fascinates me about these bottles, these mainstream kind of bottles of whiskey, is that this is still 12 year old. You know, it's still aged for 12 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. So they've got like massive massive like volumes of this whiskey just like constantly being made and in 12 years from now yeah they got know, it, it just blows my mind it just got tons of barrels aged every year that come out every single year so mm -hmm. yeah okay well shall we cheers cheers everybody
Chink. Uh, hmm. See what I mean? It's like it, it goes down a bit easier, doesn't it? Jameson, we tried Jameson yeah. for the first episode, I think it was. Or maybe the second episode, but that was hard to, to swallow. It was yeah, like, yeah. You, it, you it not kind of shredded your throat. You do not want to do shots of Jameson. Not you do all. not want to do shots of Jameson. Those Very Irish good. guys are uh, and gals are crazy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm like generally like not a big fan of whiskey, and definitely not of taking shots of them. Uh, like I, you know, like to sip, you know, take your time, enjoy the uh, the flavors, the aroma. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, that's not what this show's about. <laughs> <laughs> we abuse alcohol in the show. <laughs> no, but we are kind of like getting a little bit more relaxed with it. And I think last last time I did a cocktail with some gin because I was I was thinking I'm not going to take shots of Monkey Forty Seven. You did, you crazy fucker. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. I had to keep the tradition alive. Um, but, but my question was before, you know, before you had to go and answer the door, my question was when the first time you made money online, didn't you feel yeah. like, I'm not sure how you, you had, had kind of like grown up thinking about gambling, but was there this moment where you're like, ah, I'm going to have to make a decision now, whether I want to stick with this or like leave it. Cause it might become a problem. Right, right, right. <laughs> What I mean by by a problem? Oh, like, like if I start losing too much, or yeah, something, or, like if I get addicted to this, and then I, you know it turns out yeah, that yeah. I'm actually losing more than I'm earning. Right, right. So I've actually always had. Uh, I mean, like I'm I'm always like a very frugal person, and uh, I've actually never deposited any money for for poker. So like from the fifty dollars that I that I got from them. Uh, I basically started playing like extremely low stakes, you know, like you play for, for a dollar or something, you know, and like whenever you win, you win like 10 cents, 20 cents. And uh, basically, you know, just kind of start building it up. And in the beginning, it just goes very slow, you know, like, like, like from the $50, you know, in like one week time or something, I would be at like maybe 55 or maybe I went down to 45, but then, you know, I just keep on playing and, you know, you just very, very slowly uh, build that bankroll. And that's actually very important um, in poker is, you know, proper bankroll management. Uh, so mm. basically, um, in poker, you have these different stakes, you know, like you can play for $1, you can play for $2, 500 and so on. And of course, if you only play for $1 and if you are a winning player, like let's say you're much better than the rest, then it's really hard for you to, let's say, lose $20 playing those games because you'll have to lose like 20 times your buying. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it's possible you need, like, even if you're a good player, you, you can lose, you know, like three, four, five, maybe 10, uh, if you're unlucky, you know, binds. Um, but if you're like diligent with your bankroll management and just, um, only play, like, for example, let's say with $50, you know, you play these, these $1 games and then you bring it up to like $70 or something and then you can play the $2 games and then you just, you know, continue building from there. And so, um, and if you just, you know, stick to it and let's say, you know, like you go to the $2 games and then suddenly you start losing money again, then you can drop back down to the one. Uh, and then it's basically, yeah, you just always have to take into account, you know, like how much your bankroll is, how much you can afford to lose because then there's like a lot of variance in poker. So, um, the, the biggest issue or like the biggest problem with, a lot of people is they don't, you know, use proper bankroll management. They can be good players, but then they play too high and they go on a losing streak and they lose all their money. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it's indeed, it's like, if you use the proper management, it's possible to, you know, not, not go broke. Uh, it's actually quite easy. Um, you just have to diligently, you know, stick to your strategy and then, and then it works. Mm. Gotcha. I would imagine. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. You're good. When did you start realizing that, you know, this was something you're pretty good at? Yeah. Um, it's a good question. Um, because I need like in the beginning you play, you know, for such low amounts that you can't really make a living out of it. Uh, especially like the first, I don't know, first six months or something that I played, you know, you on a good day, you know, you win like 30, 40 bucks and which is you know just not enough to sustain yourself. Um, so, um, I actually was fortunate enough to have discovered the game, like when, when I was still in university, so I was still studying and I was basically playing in the evenings. Um, and, um, 
in my last year of university, I didn't really have much class anymore. Uh, I basically just had to go to the lectures, maybe, you know, five, six hours a week. Um, and I just had to write my master thesis. Um, so I, so I had a lot of spare time, you know, to play poker. And, um, so actually when I did graduate, I was kind of at the point where I think I'm good enough, you know, to give it a try. Um, like I was making decent money already back then. Uh, so I decided to, yeah, not start working yet, you know, just kind of stay home and, uh, keep grinding some poker. And, uh, I did that for, you know, just, just a few months. And yeah, I mean, after that I was making very good money. And then, uh, I decided to, to move to the Philippines with a couple of friends of mine who were also playing poker, um, because we wanted to, you know, to go somewhere more exotic, uh, also somewhere where uh, the cost of living is a bit lower. Um, why, how did you choose the Philippines? Like what, what was the criteria for your, or did yeah. you just like stumble across it one day? Um, yes and no. Like, like one of my friends who was going to join us, he, um, he lived in Thailand before, like his, his dad had to go there for work. And he actually, I think when he was 13, 14 years old or something, he went to school there. Uh, he actually knows some Thai now as well. He's from the Czech Republic and, um, he really liked Asia. So he said like, I really want to go to Asia. And I said, yeah, I mean, sure. Sounds good to me. I've never been to Asia. Uh, I've heard some good stories, but I really want to go to some place where they speak English because I want to communicate with the locals and Thailand wasn't really an option for me at the card. Uh, so then we looked at, you know, the possibilities and it was only really like Philippines and Singapore left and Singapore is very expensive. So we just, yeah, decided to go with the Philippines. Then we looked a little bit at where in the Philippines, uh, we basically didn't want to go to Manila because we thought it would be too crowded. It's like too much of a polluted city, etc. So we looked for like the second, third biggest cities in the Philippines. And then we stumbled upon Cebu and, um, we basically booked our ticket. We wanted to stay a few months. Uh, and we ended up staying, um, almost two years, I think. So, mm. um, yeah, but yeah, it was, it, I mean, like it was great there because we basically were all together in a house. We we're all, you know, playing online poker and we we're also like all uh, sharing ID strategy with each other. Cause of course, like we're not playing against each other. We're playing, you know, different games. Um, but, um, so it was, it was very nice because we were all, you know, playing pretty hard. We can like play, play a few hours a day, but then also, you know, study together, but also more importantly, you know, because you're young guys, you know, you're in an exotic country, you know, you go party, you go traveling and it was all like a, like a very good balance, like a, like a work life balance, you know, mm, uh, yeah. like a lot of hard work, but also a lot of, you know, uh, hard parties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the thing that, and that's the cool thing about being like, you know, having a, having a, a, a revenue stream that comes from online that you don't, mm -hmm. you know, have to be fixed to any location. And, and th that's one of the major pulls to, I would think any kind of like online gambling or having an online business. So the fact yeah. that you were able to just get up and go away, like I was, and like you were as well, Brian, I think we're all in the same boat is, is, is pretty cool to a lot of people and they just kind of need to get their head around how it works. But, um, yeah. but if you, so you were, so you were only 18 years old, right? When you were like really starting no, no, to, no, 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 no. So, uh, I, I graduated from university, so I was 23 years old. Oh, you're 23. Like I basically finished my, my master's first. Uh, and then I went the year after, but it is true. Some of my friends there, they were, I think, um, they were like 21 and like one guy was 19 years old. Yeah. Wow. Like he didn't even go to university. He just straight up went, went uh, with us. Um, and, um, but the dream. Know, I mean, it was, it was definitely a bit of a, of a, of a, of a big step to make, but also it felt like we all really wanted to try it out. Like we could always, you know, go back and, you know, start a job or, or whatever. But uh, we just said, you know, Let's just try it out for a few months, see how it goes. And I mean, yeah, it went, it went great. Um, and indeed, like, I, uh, agree with, like, I, I really, um, agree with you that, you know, it's just so important to have online work where you can just, you know, go wherever you want. Uh, also now, if, like, for example, in the times of the, of the pandemic, you know, I'm just working from home and like not much has changed for me. I mean, like there are a lot of people, you know, who, who don't get any income, who can't work because, you know, they're limited to, to their location. And, um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's a really nice thing to, to have. Yeah. yeah. It's, 
part about the digital nomad lifestyle, being able to live on your own terms, live where you want, how you want. Like even during the quarantine, even if you're stuck at home, I mean, you're kind of used to that lifestyle, right? So you can kind of operate still. So yeah, totally agree. It's uh, yeah, it's very valuable. What was the um, best, um, like, what was the best experience you ever had when you were playing online gambling? Like, is was there this moment where you just kind of peaked and you were like, "Fuck, <laughs> this is it!" Like, I'm really the top of my game. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess for me, um, well, uh, I guess you're like you're uh, referring to the game itself, right? Not you know like. For example, times in the Philippines that I was like, you know, yeah, really cool. the game itself for sure, yeah, game itself, right, yeah. Um, I guess it was kind of like when I was graduating, because at the same time I was really starting to make really, really good money with poker, and there was this one particular game. Um, it's um, well, uh, uh, there was this one site, and they introduced like a new type of of poker game. Um, it was basically poker, but well, I was called uh, rush poker, rush poker, as in like they wanted to create more fast paced games. Uh, so what they did, like like a normal poker game, you know, online, you let's say you get a hand and you fold and then you have to wait um, until the next hand gets dealt. Like you have to wait, you know, until everyone, you know, finishes the hand. But then in this um, rush poker thing, it was kind of like everyone is part of a pool. And if you let's say if you fold your hand, you immediately get redirected to a new table. Uh, so the action you know becomes much much faster um it also i think it created an environment where like a lot of like people that we call uh, recreational players that also really like that concept because you know they don't have to sit around and wait for a new hand they can just literally click the fold button and go to the next hand and um i actually started playing in those games almost as soon as it got invented and um yeah like i made a lot of money like the first one or two months playing that game and um, then I was, then I kind of realized like, wow, I can make a lot of money with this. Uh, if I, you know, just keep doing this basically, you know, if I don't go to work and, you know, keep doing this full time and I think it might work. Uh, How much money does a goodish poker player probably make like every month? Yeah. Just, be, just because people listening are probably wondering, what does that mean? Good money. <laughs> yeah, 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 true. I mean, um, so, to get back to my example, like for example, back then I was making, you know, maybe like a thousand dollars, sometimes two thousand dollars a month, which is like okay, but for example, the wages in Belgium are similar. So, um, and then you also work towards you know, like your uh, retirement. So I was like, it's probably not good enough, you know, to actually pursue this. So, and then in that particular month, I think I made something like ten or eleven thousand dollars, <laughs> and then I started realizing like, wow this is like five times that I could earn when I like, it's like, if I get a job. Um, so my God, that's a lot of became, money. That's a lot of money. Yeah. It's a lot of money. And then it, it suddenly became very clear. Like, wow, I can totally do this. If I can make this money, you know, even if I do this for one year, I can save up like five, six years of, of money compared to my, you know, people who just I graduated from university. Um, but, um, uh, I mean, to kind of get back to your question, um, uh, there's definitely like a, like not everyone makes like 10k a month for sure. Uh, right. There are some people that make more, but some people that make less as well. And some people they are happy, you know, getting one one k a month or something, just because they don't really want to get a job. They might not be as good as, at, at the game, but they prefer you know playing poker all day than actually you know uh, going out and get a job. Um, right. So I mean, it, it really totally depends on two things. For of course, or actually more than two things probably. It's more about how good you are as a player, how high you play as well. Cause th- there are some very good players who just can't really deal with like losing, let's say $200 in a day. Uh, but if you can't deal with losing that, then it's going to be very hard to win a lot of money as well. So they, they play basically in pretty low games. Um, like they're winning a lot there, but because the games are low, they're just not, not, mid, not winning as much. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's about how good you are and what kind of games you play. And um, there was something else I wanted to add, but uh, kind of yeah, forgot. That sounds, um, that sounds insane. That, what could you yeah. like? Seriously, okay. So your nineteen-year-old friend, if he was making yeah. something similar to that, or even more, 
Mm. Like that, I wonder like, how does that, how does that change you as a person? You've got all this freedom and you're not bound anywhere and you're making like all this money. And I don't know, man, it may, if I, if it was me, yeah, cause yeah. I know what I'm like, I would be out of control. <laughs> I would just be like everywhere doing everything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you you're you're saying what exactly happens, you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's it's not that, that we're out of control, but um, our lifestyle definitely changed a lot. Yeah, um, right. especially the first year we went to the Philippines, we we partied way too much. You know, we partied like two, three times a week. You know, we um, it was just because of need. Like we had all this freedom, we had this money. Um, like we, like we went on holidays. I think the first year we went to the Philippines, we probably went on like six, seven holidays, you know, uh, like we went to Thailand, to, to China, to Vietnam, to other parts in the Philippines, you know, um, and this is something I've never done in my life, you know, like the most I traveled was like once a year in summer, you know, like uh, summer vacations or something like that. It was mostly to, you know, places like France or, or Spain. I mean, which are nice places, but when you're then, you know, in, in Asia, uh, everything is, um, it's a lot different. Right. So, yeah. Um, it's a lot but, more exciting. I mean, like we, but like we still kind of had uh, the work ethic to still work on our game as well. Um, but we definitely could have made more money and worked harder on our poker game. But we decided to kind of balance it out. And sometimes, mm. you know, balancing too much to the to the leisure thing and not playing enough. Absolutely. But um, um it's not like we didn't play poker anymore. So like we still, we still did it, but indeed we, like we could have definitely been more productive, but I don't think I would change a thing right now because it was just like, we got all this freedom and we just kind of wanted to make use of it. And uh, I wouldn't change anything right now, even though it could give me more savings now, but I don't really care. It was like, it's also about, you know, your experience for sure. So yeah, for sure. No, I agree with you. But, um, so once you kind of got to the point where, well, actually, let me ask you, when did you get to the point where you figured out you're not really that interested to continue? I mean, cause I know that you've changed your direction. Yeah, yeah. It's not like you're doing online gambling right now. So yeah, yeah. what, what happened? Actually, I am doing it right now, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. But no, but, but, but no, you're right. Like, uh, um, so I basically, I think I started playing in 2008 and I played all the way up to 2014. I think that's when I was literally a full-time poker player and I wasn't doing anything else about six, seven years. Um, and so that, like a few things changed. Like I still liked poker, but definitely got a little bit bored of it because you know, it's the same thing for, for six, seven years. Um, and um, something else, uh, also the, the games itself. So poker kind of became more restricted in like a lot of, um, countries, like a lot of countries started banning poker, mostly because they're all on these like offshore sites and it's very hard to tax it for them. So they basically banned people from playing in these games. And a lot of countries actually started their own kind of like government run poker site. For example, Get like the fuck in, out of here. <laughs> uh, in France, in Spain, they oh, all shit. like, like you can play poker, but only on our site. So they can tax the people only for her majesty. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I mean, because of that, like the player pool got a lot smaller and it's also, for example, in, in poker, you know, like, like we distinguish between winning and losing players. And, um, for, of course the winning players, it's their, is their income, it's their livelihood. So they're more likely to get out of their way to continue playing. For example, let's say if you live in France and you can't play anymore, only on these sites, but it's very hard to make one of these sites because you know, the, the taxes are so high, then they will try and move somewhere else. Like for example, they can come to the Philippines or to Thailand or, or somewhere and try to play from there because yeah. then they wouldn't have to pay the taxes anymore. But then would the regulations and the moderation of it go down as well as a result? Because I know that when you move to somewhere like the Philippines and you open up a, an online gambling company, I'm pretty sure you're not being kind of you know spied on by the government as to whether or not you're doing things right. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I mean, like, of course, it depends on the country you're going to. Uh, but like, I know, for example, for the US, there were a lot of players in the US that went to, I think, Costa Rica and Mexico because of the laws there. Um, but they didn't have to pay any any taxes on their poker income there. So, um, like, you had a lot of people from the US, you know, migrate over there. Um, 
I mean, like of the of the professional players. But then, you know, for someone who's a recreational player, they don't really bother with, you know, going to another country to play poker. You know? yeah. Of course, they just, you know, they stay where they live. And so the amount of like good players went up and the amount of, of you know, not so good players went went down. So the environment got, got tougher and tougher. Mm. Um, and also because combined with the fact that I got a bit bored of it, uh, I decided to do something else. And I had a friend of mine, he was into e-commerce. And like he basically just started his business, um, I think uh, maybe about seven, eight years, or no, seven, eight months before um, I stopped playing poker. And I talked to him and he was talking about how it's, you know, it's also a gold mine. It was really fun. And like he was making really good money. And uh, I knew him from poker. And um, I said like, well, it sounds interesting. Like I kind of want to try something new. And I've always, like, like when I was younger, I always kind of wanted to start my own business. Um, so I kind of felt like this is something that I could do as well. Um, I kind of learned from him and, um, yeah. And so I basically then, I think 2014 started my, my e-commerce firm. And, um, what was that about? Yeah, I've been doing, what did you guys do? Yeah. You so, uh, we basically just, um, um, we, we got in touch with some suppliers in, in China, a particular products. And, uh, we told them for some, for, for us some samples. Then we, um, basically changed some things on the design, et cetera, and, and the branding. And we basically made our own brand and then we manufactured those products and sent them to, uh, the U S in the beginning to, to the, uh, the warehouses of, uh, of Amazon. And then, yeah, started selling online and, um, I was surprised at how easy everything was. I mean, easy as in I could run the whole business from my laptop. You know, I can talk to the suppliers. I can talk to like quality controls. I can talk to the forwarders, the people, you know, who send the products from China to the U S um, even, you know, dealing with the customer service through Amazon, I can do everything on my laptop. So again, you know, it was something that, that I really enjoyed because again, I can go on a holiday and I can still work. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, th that's when we started doing that. And I didn't really play any more poker, um, for a long time after that. Yeah. I basically mm. started working a lot on the business and I actually just sold this business now, uh, last, last month. Um, so, uh, we listed it for sale and, um, yeah, we, like we found a buyer and right now we're just going to like a transitioning process where I'm, you know, uh, educating, teaching him about how to run the business. Oh, okay. uh, but in about one month, uh, we'll all be, be finished and uh, I'll be ready to do something new. Congratulations, uh, man. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Man. What kind of product are you guys selling? Um, like we basically tried a few things. Um, like we started off with a, uh, a, a hydration belt, which is something you use for running. Um, it basically, it's like a running belt where you can put in your, your, your phone and your keys. And but it also has some bottles, you know, uh, that you can fill with water or, or sports drinks or whatever you want. And you can basically, you know, just go running and have all these things with you. Um, so, uh, we, we got one of those, uh, and actually the biggest market we went into was, uh, ice packs, the ice packs, you know, just the thing you put in the freezer, you know, for injuries. Um, like we had them made with like specific, um, designed like, uh, wraps for each body part. So for example, uh, we had like, we had one for our wrist where you can basically put the ice pack inside of a, a wrap and then you just wrap it around your, your wrist. Uh, and then you can just, you know, walk around uh, with it. Um, same, I mean like same for your wrist, your, your back, your knee, uh, et cetera. And actually those products did really well for us because we kind of sticked with that market. And we just kind of like expanded within the markets. Like we have about, I think 10 products or something in that category. Um, and, and yeah, uh, that went pretty well. And in the beginning it was a lot of work, of course, because you have to, you have to, um, you know, build your brand. You have to take care of, you know, the listings, images, descriptions, packaging. Um, but like once you have done all that work, um, Oh yeah. It's like, there's still the, the, whole, the whole advertising part, which is also very important. Like you have to, um, basically make like a PPC system for like a bunch of keywords uh, and all that. But all these things, like once you do it, um, it's kind of done. And, um, the business kind of became very passive after like one year, we didn't really put as much work into it anymore. The only 
things that really were needed for maintenance where you have to take care of customer complaints, customer service, but we hired someone to do that here in the Philippines. Um, and um, other than that, you also have to keep track of your inventory and then, you know, to, so you can basically restock uh, before running out. Uh, but other than these, excuse me, these two things, um, there was like not much to do. Uh, of course, like we weren't growing the business anymore. Like we weren't creating new products. We were like, we weren't creating um, new list things, but we were happy with, you know, the sales we were receiving. And it kind of was pretty steady, you know, um, it did go down slowly, but it was all like pretty, pretty gradual. So it was actually like for two, three years, it was a very, very passive income. Like we didn't really, I think I spent like maybe two, three hours a week on it or something. So um, it was really, really quite passive. When you say we, who are you talking about? Uh, that's uh, me, me and Eileen. She's uh, my ex-girlfriend, like my girlfriend at the time. Uh, right. Started together. Yeah. So how, how was that running a business with your girlfriend? Um, it was pretty okay. I mean, like, of course we were also living together. So it's easy. You can, you know, constantly talk to each other. And, um, no, it was actually, I mean, like she was a great, great help. Like I, I couldn't have done without it. I mean, I mean, I without her. So, uh, um, yeah, I mean, again, like I would, I would do the same thing, you know, if I had to go back in time, uh, because I need like a lot of people, they, uh, they said like, yeah, but how does it work? You know, you and your girlfriend. And also because we, we, we broke up when we still had the business, you know? So then again, people were like, how do you manage, you know, something? Yeah. Like interesting. So, just, there's a lot of money involved still, but I mean, no, we were, we were very good in, in not dealing with it. Yeah. That's amazing. I think most, in most cases that probably would have, wouldn't have gone so well. I would, I would imagine, I would imagine, but that's just me. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it really depends on, on the whole region, but, you know? Yeah, for sure. It's like not everyone breaks up because I mean, some shit happens, you know, like it can also just be, you know, for other reasons. So do you want to take another shot everybody or how do you feel? Uh, yeah, sure. I already have one poured up here. <laughs> Why not? You, oh, you already have one poured up. It's that bad. This conversation. <laughs> I'm thirsty, you know, I'm thirsty. <laughs> yeah, this one's a lot easier. You're, you, you should be happy that you weren't present for our uh, Bombay Sapphire special. Oh, shit. Oh. <laughs> Having all that floral Bombay, essence. I've had a shot of it, yeah. You know? <laughs> I'm the monkey, man. No gin ever again. <laughs> Yeah. Gin's a special one when you're taking shots of it. There's something about it. It just doesn't make sense. But, um, it's like but in, a, in a cocktail, it's, it's like drinking cool. essential oil. Just, <laughs> yeah, it is like drinking essential oil. <laughs> That's a good point. All right. Yeah. Let's do this. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Ooh. So what's um, what's next for you then? <laughs> it's a good question. It's a good question. Um, I think you're involved in something else that we haven't touched on, but maybe that's yeah, yeah. ongoing. Uh, yeah, yeah, I need. So uh, I did start like uh, an esports team here in the Philippines, um, but it's still like it's a small project for for now. Like, um, I'm not entirely sure yet, like what I want to continue doing, but, um, uh, something that, that I've been doing a lot the past months is, um, I actually used to be like very much into investing because I actually also studied finance. Um, like my master's was, in, was I was in finance. Uh, so I've always like been really interested in investing oh, in the stock market. Yeah. Um, and also actually like, uh, you can definitely argue that gambling is very similar to, or like professional gambling is very similar to investing as well. Um, but anyway, so, um, I've, I've been like really like, uh, doing quite a bit of research lately, uh, on stocks and the stock markets in general, because of course also now when we sold the business, you know, we have some money that uh, I have ready to be invested. So, uh, I was looking, you know, to get back into that. And, um, it's actually like I'm spending quite a bit of time on that right now, but, but also like, it's not something that I want to do actively as in, you know, like, I don't want to, like want to become a trader. It's more like, I want to 
um, know how to like long-term invest. So it does take some time looking over the companies and, um, just like looking at their strategies, etc. But right. it's also something that I think it's going to be a bit active, but it's just going to be a couple of hours a week. I think that I need to spend on it, you know, long-term, um, to just kind of like follow up on them or like look for new opportunities, uh, but it's not something that I want to be like be like a day trading and be like, you know, 10 hours a day looking at the charts and all that. No, it's more you, like you got involved in that recently, didn't you, Brandon? And, uh, yeah. It's a headache. It's not fun. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I know. Yeah, when you're stuck in quarantine, man, I mean, you'll, you'll try anything at some point, but yeah, yeah. long-term investing is a lot smarter. Um, you know, look for good teams, people that are going to be in place that can grow a company over time. It's mm -hmm. a lot smarter yeah, yeah. Than to do it daily. You'll just drive yourself insane, but you can make money that way. It's just, yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. That was, yeah, I've actually also done it for a little bit, but yeah, it was also not really like my cup of tea and I, it's a neat, like very, 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 like very frustrating. And, um, uh, you also need a very, very strong, like mental, uh, strength uh, for it. Um, but I need, like, uh, I do agree, like just investing long-term just sounds more, more fun to me as well. Like, but also uh, I really like thinking about the future and like how the future looks like. And I think investing for the long term, um, you kind of have to think about the future. Like, you know, like for example, um, I would probably like not be, you know, investing in, let's say like a, um, like a store where you go buy DVDs, you know, because in 10 years from now, you know, those won't exist anymore. They probably don't even exist right now anymore. But, um, and like, uh, you're talking about I just mean, bought loads like, of DVDs yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> like you basically like think about like, what, like, what do you think will the world, you know, be like in 10 years from now and just like invest in, you know, the technologies that, uh, you think will bring us there. Mm. <clears throat> do you, um, have any thoughts about the direction that we're headed with the global economy and what that's going to have as an impact on the stock market, for example? Uh, yeah, that's a very, very good question. Uh, like a few months ago, um, there was a, you know, like a, a very, very big downturn due to the, the Corona crisis. Um, I think it was February, March, the stock markets went down like 40% or something in, in one month. I think it was like one of the biggest drops, if not the biggest drop in history together with, uh, the great depression in 1929. Um, and so it's, it's a bit unsure that, um, like some people think that, you know, that was it, like that was the bottom, like now it's just going to be going up again. Um, but there are definitely also a lot of people that think, um, there are a lot of like this lockdown, you know, this basically the, the, uh, the economy, you know, that stopped for like a few months, um, can have like very, very large implications, you know, for, for the future on like a lot of, like not only the people, because, you know, like a lot of people went, went jobless, um, but also for, for companies, um, like I actually read a pretty interesting art article, uh, just, uh, I think last week about the whole sector of, uh, agriculture, um, because basically because of the, the lockdown and because of the uh, restrictions on like, uh, travel of, of, of immigrants and workers. Um, a lot of the, the crops that needed to be planted weren't planted because there were just no people to actually do it. Um, and they are predicting like a, a like a, a hike in food prices, but also just um, the food supply will be much lower because of because of that. Because you know, like a lot of farmers, they just couldn't couldn't get the crops planted in in mm. in at a planting season, so the harvest will be much, much lower. And, that, and that's something you don't see right now because, um, it hasn't really taken into effect yet. I mean, um, it's going to take a few more months to actually unfold and to see like, Oh yeah, actually, you know, we're kind of running low on food. Um, and you know, food prices will go up and like a lot of poor people might not even be able to afford food anymore. Um, just because of the fact that there is just not as much food as, as other years. Um, and like there are other sectors as well that I think will will get punished uh, for of the I mean like the the actions taken by by the government. Um, I mean I'm not saying the actions were wrong, or I'm just saying it's going to have effects, and um, some are still to come. 
like some, like some of them already happened, but some sectors, you know, we still have to, to wait and see what's going to happen. So uh, there's definitely a lot of uncertainty and I'm not entirely sure. I, I predicted the market will probably go down in the next months, but I can be wrong. But, uh, mm. Yeah, it really depends on how they roll out some of these phases. At least, I know this is new in the U.S. They're rolling it out in phases and trying to get people back to work as soon as possible. And they're doing similar stuff in Colombia too. But supply chains are, you know, badly affected right now. People are stuck at home. Um, you know, they can't get to work. There's millions of people in the U.S. applying for unemployment. Yeah, uh, it's it's I think it was 11 million just recently. Another 11 million applied. It's crazy. All the time. More people can't go back to work and do normal things. And more people are going to apply for them. And then it's, well, yeah, they yeah. Work, can't make money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like personally, I think the market would have gone down more already if it wasn't, you know, for the Fed stepping in and uh, giving a lot of, you know, cash to, to, to businesses. Um, like it was, I think, unseen, like the amounts of money being pumped into the economy. That's why, you know, the markets are up now because they think like, oh, okay, and nothing's happening. Um, but that might still have some, you know, long-term effects, you know, like paying back debts and all that. And it's, it's hard to judge. Uh, yeah, a lot of people think the economic activity won't come back for another like five, six, seven years, um, at least where it was before the, the virus. It, one of the biggest issues, at least in the U.S., is the fact that all these small businesses are struggling because they can't reach their clients and their customers. Um, yeah. While a lot of them are innovating, uh, a lot of them are still struggling and they are forced to take on these loans from the government. And over yeah. time, they might not be able to pay those back and a lot of them might default. And that'll just yeah. ripple the economy. It, it doesn't look like a good situation long term right now. But yeah, I'm trying to be optimistic about it though. There's some companies are doing very well. Mm. On the side. Tech companies are doing very well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. This is a big question mark for everyone, I suppose. There's not really anything sure that we could give as advice, but. Uh, it's definitely good to think about the future, like you said. I mean, a lot of people have trouble with that because inherently they have so many issues to deal with in the in the present moment. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, it's very difficult to to think about anything else when you're, you know, maybe you're going to starve because you don't have money yeah, to yeah, pay for your for your family's food, and I and I can totally appreciate that. So. Um, yeah. It, no, you're right. You're right. Like, like we're actually quite privileged you need to be able to think about these things, you know, because we don't have to worry about, you know, getting food for the next months. Uh, yeah. I'll be fine for, for a few years, whatever happens. Uh, and that's a yeah. good, like, that's a great luxury to have. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, have you, have you thought about leaving the Philippines once this is all done? Um, yeah, I have thought about it, but I, I think I'll stay here for a little longer. I don't know. Um, like, like uh, I, I used to like go travel a lot when I was, you know, basically just, just graduated because, you know, it was the first time I was living alone. The first time, you know, having all these freedoms. So I was, you know, going everywhere, but now I, I kind of like being in the same place a little bit more and just focusing on other things like focusing on, on reading or focusing on, working on your business or, you know, all these things, um, like travel is like, it kind of became less important for me because I traveled already a lot. So, um, I think I'll, yeah, just, just stay here for, for, I mean, I guess it also depends a bit on, on the situation here, like how the government will deal with the situation after the lockdown compared to yeah. other countries. Like if I feel like it's too strict, uh, I might indeed leave, but, uh, mm. we'll that's what I was thinking too. That. That's, yeah. that's one of the reasons why I, I asked, I suppose. Dude, if you're going to stay there, I'm going to have to keep going over back to the Philippines. <laughs> I have to keep visiting you. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been really fascinating talking to you about all this stuff. I, I, like I said, we haven't really had a, that chat before. And yeah, I think that's that, true. But... Yeah, anyone, yeah, I mean, anyone... Like, um... I, I guess I wanted to, to, to say something more about any, like, like the gambling, uh, like, um, it's, uh, um, like there's this great book. It's uh, called, uh, the man of all markets from Edward O. Thorpe. And, uh, he was also, uh, the author of, um, beat the dealer, 
And uh, he was basically the guy who, like, like he was a polymath, like he was into mathemat in uh, mathematics, uh, quantitative finance, uh, statistics, and all that. And he was the first guy who kind of invented um, counting cards in, in blackjack. Mm. And he made a lot of money with that because um, because he just didn't even know that you can you know beat the game of blackjack. Um, I mean, now it's very hard, but I, I can get to that later. But um, basically, because before, you know, like, I think it was 1958 or something where where he uh, published his book. And um, like back then, you know, blackjack games, it was just with one deck. Um, and which is a big difference to the games nowadays. Basically, with one deck, it's uh, much easier to be able to count cards. Uh, like if you have, you know, like if you're a smart mind, um, you can indeed. And like he also developed a system to like basically quickly kind of um, give like a, a coefficient to like the cards that had been dealt, then basically you know bet more or less. Um, uh, dependent on you know the info he got from before, and um, he he started making a lot of money uh, with that just because he basically developed a system that that beats the system. Um, actually, to the point where like a lot of casinos started banning him because they know that <laughs> yeah, this guy makes more than other people. Yeah. And like actually, literally, like if he comes in, they would tell him to leave. Um, and um, so like he would then you know kind of like start uh, disguising himself you know like for example like putting on like a beard and like, <laughs> up, like uh, as an asian man or something and then you know just just uh, going into the casinos and and it sometimes worked again but then you know they always would find him because of the way that you know he, he just wins too much at the game um and then they actually they realized they had to change the, their system um, so then they actually, um, like, I, I think right now, if you go play black, blackjack, there are six decks, you know, so instead of, you know, 52 cards, you know, you get like, what, like 300, uh, and 12 right, cards. Yeah. So, um, it's much, much harder to count those, uh, because also, even if you're counting, um, the impact will be much lower than in one deck. So it's, exactly. it's almost impossible to make any money with blackjack right now. I think right. it's still possible, but you'll need to have, I don't know, some, some calculator device or something with you. Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, but, um, it's no, it's actually a very interesting book. Like, like, like I highly recommend reading it because, uh, so he, um, he, he basically, you know, did that. Then he also uh, invented like a, a way to actually beat roulette, which is considered to be an unbeatable game. Um, because, there is really no edge you can you can you can get. The only way you can beat the game is um, if perhaps let's say the table or something is a little bit flawed that it you know um, gets one number more often than others just because of the way it's tilted or something. Like maybe like there's a little I don't know unevenness somewhere. Um, that's like the only thing that I can think of right now that you can actually you know um, be better than just like a. Uh, a normal a normal outcome but like he basically developed a computer it was actually the, the first wearable computer ever like it was it was a watch so he uh, i think it was like I, I think he made a watch that was a computer and um, the, um like what the what the computer did was it had a camera and it would um look at the ball and basically calculate the velocity of the of the ball and then um based on that he could predict that you know the number would be probably like within this range um, oh my god and so it how, was, how like, well, when did this happen for, like what what yeah. was the year that this was created this was in the 60s how is that possible that you can create a watch that in, in the 60s that would track the velocity well, of the ball and calculate it the, the guy was a genius but uh <laughs> that's crazy um, yeah i don't even think nasa would have been able to do that <laughs> <laughs> but, but well because in in roulette right you can you can still bet even if the ball is still spinning like like they will i think after a, some time they will say okay no more bets now but um you can still you know bet after they actually spun the ball initially and of course you know with the, the laws of newton you know like the uh the force you know i mean like uh, the force will be the same so um like once it is spinning um, he can already need like calculate, you know, a, a bunch of things. And, um, that actually allowed him to make uh, some very good money with roulette as well. And 
um, he actually, it was harder for the casino to catch him because it's, but nobody thought you could win a test at roulette because in blackjack, of, like yeah. you need, like after a while, people thought like, okay, yeah, I guess it's possible if you do this, yeah, like, like if you do this and this, but with roulette, that, like there's no way you can win. So um, it just makes way. me wonder about what kind of stuff people are doing these days that we don't know about, you know, in the casinos, yeah. because there's some serious tech now that you can, you know, I mean, if that was the sixties, <laughs> this tech nowadays though can easily analyze some of these games. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. But it's also now I'm pretty sure that also like a security, you know, it's, it's, yeah, they're it's pretty much stricter nowadays. Pretty and if, if they catch you, like if you're winning more than you should, they really don't like that. So uh, they really, you know, break down on, on those kind of people. Just don't yeah, go to a casino on, with online. Like for example, uh, I was, playing some poker on a poker site and I was winning a lot of money there. And uh, the site told me to, they told me to withdraw my money and they would block my account. Just go fuck yourself. Because they, because they didn't want to have any players that basically win too much. Like the, the thing that poker sites want, they want to have people that um, basically can play a lot and not win a lot of money because that means that they, all the money they earn kind of like goes back to a rake and they're, they're not making much. And, but if you're making a lot of money, you basically take money from one person and give it to yourself and cash out. While if everyone is kind of like the same level, everyone is just kind of not winning much, not losing much and just paying rake, paying rake, paying rake. Um, so we need like, it's, I can understand their point of view, but it's also, I don't know, it's, yeah, of course. I, of course, I didn't like it because you know it was hurting my <laughs> my income. But that is insane, man! That you were asked to leave an online gambling website. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, would I would imagine. I would imagine it'd be it'd be it'd be probably more. It would probably be more plausible if you were asked to leave an actual physical establishment as opposed to an online gambling place, yeah. because there's just probably so many more players. Uh, yes, but. Mm -hmm. The thing is also, for example, with sports betting, it's also something that happens. I, like, I know some of the big sports betting sites, if you make money consistently on them, they ask you to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose it's their they, right they at the end of the day, it. but uh, it still feels kind of well, they're shiny, doesn't a it? profit business. I mean, obviously they're trying to make money. They don't really want you to fix it. Yeah. Potentially helping someone else fix the game and then it spirals out of control eventually. So yeah. Yeah. You. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This is the crazy yeah, world of gambling. Yeah. It's actually also a very interesting market, the sports betting market, uh, which is also like a market where there are some very, very big winners. Like some people really make a lot of money with sports betting, but of course you have also the majority of people, you know, they lose money there. Um, so if you want to play, like, let's say someone's listening to this or watching this and they're like, ah, oh, shit. Yeah. I want to, I want to start this. Like what, what, what's the situation now when it comes to getting into this? Is it a lot harder than it used to be? Uh, it definitely is a lot harder than it used to be. Like I personally, I would never recommend anyone to, to go and do online gambling. Uh, Especially in the sites that like you go to, right? Things <laughs> like, no, it's, it's more, um, I've seen people try it and I've seen a lot of people fail. Um, right. So as long as you know um, of the risks of it, um, and as long as you start very small and make sure that you can win at like the lowest stakes, and then, you know, just gradually go up from there, um, then yeah, you can do it. But it's not something that, um, like, uh, I wouldn't like go to my friends and be like, Hey, you really got to try online poker, man. It's a gold mine. Um, like, cause it's not true. It's, it's, it's hard. And a lot of people fail. And, um, but if you want to do it, then yeah, just know the risks and yeah, go ahead and do it. But, um, so do you think that online gambling's had its heyday already? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um, because also like with sports betting, for example, um, I think you can still make money, but indeed, like, um, I think sites got better and better at, you know, finding the correct odds, uh, et cetera. And I mean, I don't know, I, I think it's probably still, still possible, but it's, uh, it's definitely, it's definitely a pretty hard environment. And, um, 
<clears throat> How would you know which sites not to play on? Um, that's you gotta look online on, on the forums, etc. Like for that, for, for sports betting, I know there are a few sites that even allow winning players to to win because uh, they kind of see it as um like. Wait, uh, there are two different types of sports betting, like sports betting sites. You basically have sites where the site itself is the, the bookmarker and they basically make the odds for the game. So mm. that's usually the ones where you can, especially if you're early on, like let's say, you know, they just posted the odds they think for the game of tomorrow. Um, then that's where, you know, like the most mismatch is. Uh, so then you could, like, that's, I think where you can make the most money because that's where, you know, the odds are probably the, the most skewed towards, you know, being in a, in a bad kind of place. Um, but then also like the more people bet on one side, the site, they kind of see that and then they start shifting the odds a little bit lower. So the other side gets more favorable. And then basically, um, they look at the pattern of like the bets coming in and then always kind of like balance it that way where um it doesn't seem like everyone is betting on one side um if that makes yeah. sense yeah um but then there's another particular type of uh, sports better sites out there they are what they call like sports betting exchanges so you're basically you can it's kind of like a stock market you can like list um a particular like let's say you know like you want to have a particular odds where you want a certain team to win, you can list that and other people can take that bet or not. Mm. So uh, in this way, the site actually doesn't lose money because the site takes a little commission on sure. each trade. So there's actually no risk to the site. And very often as a player, you can actually get better deals um, because um, on the, uh, well, well let, let's call the exchange type, you know, type B and uh, the other one type A, because in type A you can, um, like basically the spread is much larger because the, the company needs to have like a bigger buffer to kind of make money for themselves. Right. Well, in the exchange, they usually charge smaller commissions because they, they always, they are, they're hundred percent sure of getting commission. So like there's no risk for them uh, while, you know, in, in, in Taipei it's not the same, but so also, you know, for players, you can generally get better deals, you know, on the exchange uh, types of um, companies because you get less commission, like they take less. Um, so you get better deals too. So actually like a lot of the bigger sites right now are venturing towards like the exchange type of uh, sports betting, um, Sounds which like it makes more sense for both parties. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, Maybe that's somewhere people could get started. Yeah. Right. But, I mean, of course, you know, there's still commission, so there's still, um, there will still always be more winners, I mean, uh, more losers than winners. Yeah. So, uh, but it's it's interesting it's interesting for sure but it's very hard man it's very hard to to make money because there's so much variance involved that you really have to like bet big amounts to actually make money over the long term and you're gonna have a lot of like we call it swings you know like you're gonna like swing up like five thousand down ten thousand down twenty thousand up um just to get like an average of like you know three four thousand income gotcha uh, so that's something that will deter a lot of people from actually doing it because um, just like the emotional, you know, like feeling of a loss of like $10,000, you know, it's a, yeah, it can be devastating for some people. And right. That's stressful. Wanna make, yeah. Yeah. I need, it's very stressful. So that's yeah. why I don't really recommend anyone to become a professional gambler because it's, <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, I know for a fact that most people are not that good at uh, thinking about the long term and dealing with the short term pain. <laughs> They'd rather have it the other way around. Uh, yeah. There was a, there's, I think there's a Simpsons kind of, there's a scene where Homer Simpson's like, he sees a vision of him in the future and it's, it's an awful vision of him. And he's like, yeah. Oh my God, I'm so glad I'm not that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and um uh yeah i think a lot of people kind of subconsciously feel that way they can just put things off and uh anyway so dude that that's that's been absolutely fascinating man and there's been so many things that i've learned about this that i had no idea about so suffice to say i won't be getting involved in gambling 
after this uh, conversation. Uh, yeah, plus, yeah. my Chinese genes probably are a good indicator of, <laughs> of not doing that in the first place anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, that's good. Like, uh, that's a good takeaway, at least. Uh, yeah. If you're Chinese, you can don't try, touch it. But it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's going to be very, very hard. Uh, yeah. But actually, back in the day, when I was starting out, I actually did recommend it to a lot of friends because I thought it was a bit easier back then as well. And um, But yeah, right now, I wouldn't really recommend it to anyone. Uh, I, I think if you can make it in the gambling world, if you can make a good living, you could have made so much more if you start your own business or if you did something else with it. Mm. Uh, because it means that you're probably very intelligent and you're hardworking and you can probably make more more anywhere else. So uh, mm. that's also why I wouldn't really recommend doing it. But Yeah. Well, what do you think would be, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to ask both of you, what do you think would be a good place to put your time and effort if you've got a job and you just want to start to get into making some some more passive long-term income these days? All right. Um, I personally, I would probably do something like, uh, private labeling, like what I did, like, you know, in, in e-commerce or, uh, drop shipping, something like that. I think those are the things that are probably pretty easy to do on the site. Um, and that have pretty good upside potential. It's still, it's still not easy. Like you're still gonna have to work hard. You're gonna have to get good ideas and even even if you're smart, even if you have good ideas, if you, have, if you work hard, you might still fail. Um, yeah. It doesn't mean that you fail because of what you did. It might just be because of other factors. Like maybe, you know, the market you went into was just very bad to enter into. And that's something maybe you couldn't have known because of particular factors that just were out of your control. Um, while other people can maybe even make money when, with not doing much and kind of getting lucky, but, um, as long as you do these three things, you'll have a high chance of success, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not guaranteed, but it's there. Yeah, and also, I, I suppose no one really saw coronavirus coming, so, you know, that also probably, well, I know for a fact it did, threw a lot of people out. I don't think we saw it having the impact that it had, though. Yeah. yeah, true. Well, I remember when I first heard about it and um, realized it was kind of serious, I wasn't thinking about this. This wasn't anything that was kind of crushing my mind. You know, people close countries closing and, uh, you know, not being able to go to work and people losing jobs. So this whole thing, yeah, no one saw it coming. I just thought it was going to be like a contained event, you know, that was not really that like, you know, I know someone who got, um, what, what was that? Um, SARS. I know someone who got SARS and they were really sick and they were yeah. from, they were living in the U S at the time. And I was like, but then, you know, it wasn't a, a pandemic. It just kind of fizzled out. Yeah. So this was crazy. This was super crazy. But, um, yeah, yeah. I still think yeah. that, you know, getting, get, you know, investing your time and money on, on something digital would be, would be really worthwhile for people listening to this, even oh, if yeah. it's just a little to start with. Actually, maybe like one thing I can add, because like not everyone has like the resources to start your own business. Because even like if you want to do private labeling, I think you'll need at least like three, four thousand dollars to you know get started with some inventory and buy some products. And not everyone has that, of course. So um, yeah. something that you can also do, uh, or that I can highly recommend, you know, to people who don't have the means to do it, is doing freelance work, like you know, sites like Upwork, Fiverr. Um, like everyone has a skill, you know, everyone can do something that someone else can't, but someone else is willing to pay money for that. Yeah. Um, but like, let's say if you're very good at website design, or if you're very good at, you know, like creating logos or like thinking of, you know, um, copywriting, marketing slogans or something, you know, just like list your services on a site, like Upwork, um, just kind of like, you know, put your CV on there, put your portfolio on there and, <laughs> Um, you can also like contact people like, yeah, I, I have this experience. I think, you know, I can be of good use to your project, you know, and try and get some freelance work, you know, just work online and do your thing and you can get money that way. And with that money you can save, you can, you can then, uh, put that money into a business maybe later on. Um, but I think like 
there are so many ways you can make money online and um, you just have to, yeah, just, just, you have to start doing like, like a lot of people that I know that have a job and they would like to get some side income. They just don't get started. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's something you really want, just get started. Even if it's just half an hour a day, half an hour a day, spend some time on it, you know, mm. just look at what you can do. Look at how to sign up. Look at, I mean, yeah, just, just something. And, you know, just get the ball rolling and build from there. Yeah. Get some momentum. <laughs> and where people yeah. get you know, most confused is with their cash, cash flow management. You know, they, they'll, they'll come into some cash and then they'll spend it on something or they'll make an impulse buy. Um, or they just won't put it towards something that, you know, will create passive income or they will help yeah, yeah. the business. Um, or they don't buy an asset. They, they spend it on something to be considered a liability. Stuck. not like people never come into the money either. It's just, even if they do make the right decisions and make money, it's like, what are they spending it on? Most people aren't spending it on the things they probably should be. You know, some of it's education and, mm. uh, other times it's just, you know, just poor management skills too. But I think that's yeah, a yeah. for the issue. I think even if you were to spend your money on uh, a really bad business decision and it didn't pan out and you lost that money, at least you've had a lesson. Like I remember spending a lot of money, uh, on, um, like, a an, an expo, you know, for, for, yeah. for advertising the business, it was a really bad investment. And, uh, for a number of reasons, but like, I, I will never do that in that way again. I might do it again, but I'm, I will never do it that way again. So I've learned a lesson, you know, whereas if I, you know, I just wanted that money on, on personal stuff, then yeah, but, but that stimulus check, uh, you know, that arrived in the, in the U S for people is, is pretty sad because, you know, that's, that's something they're only going to, I think they only get once, right, Brandon? Well, they got it a couple of times. I only received it once, but as soon as I got it, it I invested it straight away. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Money. Um, I, obviously a lot of people are using it for rent and food and things like that. But yeah, I think we got a couple of them. We had one in April. We had one in May. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to get one in June, but they were talking about upping it and then there'd be some contingencies with that. But mm -hmm. there's also a lot of loans going out too, which is the thing I worry about most is people taking on these loans because they're desperate and then not being able to pay them back or not getting forgiven five, 10 years down the line. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, I think yeah, I totally point. agree with that as well. And also about the stimulus checks, I got a pretty, pretty funny, funny or sad story. Uh, <laughs> like, you um, choose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So no, it was basically uh, a poker site that kind of um, uh, released their data a few days after a, a stimulus check arrived, and they had like a, oh my god a sudden surge of like literally the exact amounts of the stimulus checks you know being uploaded or like being deposited to accounts like people depositing like a thousand two hundred dollars everyone you know like exact deposits of that amount Jeez. and they said people you know. This is where oh, some people God. spent their stimulus check on. And, and I totally agree with Brandon. Like, I think a lot of it is just poor management. Like a lot of people, they don't know how to manage their, their savings and their money. And mm. the big problem, if you want to, you know, gain passive income, um, like, like for example, here in the Philippines, it's, it's very rampant as well. Like it's very common to see people, you know, who earn maybe six, $700 a month who buy the newest iPhone and they like buy it with like a payment plan and they're stuck for two years. And for two years, they will probably like not be able to save anything because everything goes to the new, the new iPhone. They spend, you know, $3 on a Starbucks cup. I can make it at home for 20 cents. Uh, mm -hmm. Just like, I mean, I get it that they, because they earn their money, they want to spend some, but limit, you know, like if you earn $800 a month, you know, don't spend, you know, more than 500 or something, you know, um, just like make sure you always kind of save something and definitely, definitely don't go into debt, you know, to buy something you don't really need. Uh, yeah. I always find it kind of funny when people say they have no money or they can't spend money at the moment that they have Netflix and they have HBO and they have a new iPhone and 
Yeah, yeah. It's like they have all this nice stuff and like, well, you know where the money's going. Well, there's a definitely a big conversation here, which we could have uh, another time about consumerism and emotional yeah, intelligence yeah. and things like that. But they're all wound, to, wound woven together, in my opinion. I mean, we're kind of lied to every day about the things that we should get that we don't need. So there's, there's a huge battle for people to... That that's gone on. Yeah, it's yeah. been going on for a long time now. But yeah, yeah, that that's definitely I think probably one of the takeaways is from this conversation that if you're smart about where you put your money, then maybe you can multiply it. You know, even if it's uh, online gambling or if it's in a business that you invest in or if you know stocks or whatever. But um, the most important thing is just being very mindful about where you put your money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean like the, the number one thing is savings. Like if you have money saved, if you have money that, because in order to, to make more money, you know, you either need to work or you need to have money, uh, or both, you know? Um, but yeah, if you want to, you know, start a business, you'll need money. So if you, if you need money, you know, you have to save some money first. Um, that's the hard part, you know, like, like, um, getting to like, you know, that first bit of substantial savings money is the hard part. But like once you have that and then, you know, if you are mindful about where to put it, um, I think a lot of people can increase their, their income, you know, um, mm. Mm. but yeah, it's, it all starts at the same point, you know, just save, save, save. Yeah. Uh, That's a good note to end it on. That was a great conversation. And I uh, really, really appreciate you coming on and telling us about your history with gambling and what you're doing. And uh, yeah, it's been a real pleasure, man. Thank you so much. Do you guys want to do another yeah, shot? Thank, <laughs> uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, yeah, sure. Once we knock one out. Let's knock one out. We might as well. One that puts me to bed. <laughs> <laughs>